So thanks to the composers that sent scores in for me to have a look at, we're going to look at three today. The first is called Pyjamas by Connor Black. First off, there's a notation issue in bar 10. You've written a B major arpeggio, but you've spelt it B, E flat, F sharp. And when you have a pattern like this that is obviously a well-known chord or scale or arpeggio, you should usually notate it in the most obvious spelling. So in this case, B, D sharp, F sharp. So this piece doesn't stick in a key as such. It just moves a chord up and down in parallel motion. It goes down on a minor chord, D minor, C minor, B minor, A minor and then goes back up using the major chords. Now, this is a very effective tool for creating certain kinds of atmosphere, and you could try extending the idea by using more extended chords, like a minor chord with a sharp seven, which has a sort of spooky sound. And let's hear how that sounds with your minor chords, just with that added sharp seven. It's worth remembering that you can do this and still maintain a sense of a tonic or a home, uh, this is something that John Williams does in the Harry Potter tune, for example. All he has to do is hold down a bass note and then he's just moving around in minor chords above it. Have a listen to how great it sounds. Next up is a piece by Stephen Bailargen. I hope I've got your name right. It's called Tabula Rasa and it's written for cello and piano. Let's have a listen. Again, a notation thing first, let's look at these 9-8 bars. Musicians are used to seeing 9-8 as being divided into three groups of 3 8 notes, but that's not something you've done here. In the first one, for example, I'd rather see this as a 5-8 followed by a 2-4, or even better perhaps, just a pause on the G sharp. It feels like the long note there could just take a pause and you could have kept the whole thing in 4-4, four, four. that would have been much clearer. Let's hear a little more from the middle section of the piece. Now this is obviously really accomplished writing, both the cello writing and the piano writing are very idiomatic and the piece has a warmth to it which is really appealing. My first impression is that I'm not really clear how the form works and I think part of that is a feeling that there's not enough overall contrast in the way material is used. So it was interesting when I read your program note at the end, Stephen talks about the cello theme in this piece as being like a child who's treated differently by its two different parents who are represented in the piano. So there's a warm nurturing A section and a more distant, uncaring B section. And each of these two accompaniments treat the theme differently and lead it in different directions. So the first thing I would say is that I get a sense that your inclination is towards the nurturing side. The A sections all have this warm beauty which you seem to relish. And if I'm honest, the B sections, the more harsh ones, don't really sound harsh enough. They don't sound different enough from the A sections. So I would work on your dark side a little bit and have a look at people like Shostakovich when he's in dark mode and see how extreme his registers and his textures become. And try to think about adding even more grit into those darker sections. The second point I would make is that although you've got this concept behind the piece of the two different characters that are influencing the theme, I never feel that there's a musical motivation for why we change from one to the other. The nearest you perhaps get is at the end of the first A section where you leave the cello hanging suddenly in the air, which is a nice idea I think. It's sort of like the mother's been taken away and the, this, the, the child is left abandoned and then the other parent reluctantly takes over.
But I didn't really feel this was enough of an event. Shouldn't you feel more of a trauma when we're suddenly jolted out of this comfortable world? I suppose the other way you might want to take it is to think more cinematically and just cut between the two sections. Most of the writing is quite linear in the way it's conceived, so you might want to consider could you snap between these two ideas more abruptly so we get more of a sense that there's two separate worlds and we're kind of thrown back in two between them. I'm being quite critical here, but this is a really strong piece, so do keep up the great work. The next piece we're going to look at is Colchester Overture, Opus 10 by Dylan Christopher. Okay, so you're obviously very inspired by that sort of late classical early romantic sound world, which is great, but what I would say is don't treat that sound world as a kind of comfort blanket, preventing your own creativity and voice from taking control. I think I could sense you wanting the material to go in a certain direction, but perhaps you were feeling that it didn't match the style you'd established? That you could only allow yourself to do something if Mozart or Beethoven or whoever had done that kind of thing before? There's one section I want to focus on, which is the viola writing here. I can see that you're after this sort of undercurrent of bubbling activity in the viola, but it does go on for a long period of time in just the viola. Now, although this is very much a secondary motive, I always feel that the best music pays just as much, if not more, attention to these secondary layers than to what's going on on the surface. For a piece to be truly rich and full of interest, you want to be able to shift your focus to any layer and still find interesting things going on. Check out this example from Beethoven 7, where there's a similar texture, but you can see that he moves the secondary theme around between the different strings, so if you're following that line, there's a lot more interest to it. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you found that helpful. Please comment, like and subscribe below. And if you have your own scores that you'd like me to look at, please send them through to davidbrucecomposer at gmail.com. See you next time.